Hello, I'm Chris Schnabel, and welcome to Router Talk. I'm here today with Winston Damarillo. Winston serves as the Chief Strategy Officer for PLDT, and he just recently came back from the um, recently concluded 2016 World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, where he hung out with people like Leonardo DiCaprio, Bono, and also discussed the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Here to tell us a little bit about it is the man himself, Winston. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Yes, I'm excited to share with you what happened in Davos. Uh, how was Bono? Bono was uh, the usual Bono is very uh, intense, intense and excitable, <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, it was a fun time in Davos and uh, you know, we all had great time in negative nine degree weather. Oh man, <laughs> well welcome back to the sun I guess. Yes. Okay. So not a lot of people get to go to, um, get to participate in, in Davos, so uh, could you give us a feel of it and tell us a little bit about the fourth uh, industrial revolution? Well, Davos is very interesting for me this year. Uh, I am a geek. I love technology. And it's the first time that Davos you know, focused entirely of the impact of technology in, in our industry and, and, in fact, how we live our lives. And they put that in, in a uh, theme called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And we had an opportunity to explore its impact uh, to our industry, in fact, to how, how we would live, mm -hmm. but also get to imagine how industries will transform and, and what's in store for us. Uh, and, and it was very exciting conversations. Then not a lot of people get to go to Davos. So, I mean, what is it, uh, what's, th what's the mood there? What is it? Uh, well, well, Davos. Give us some inside information. <laughs> well, Davos <laughs> is very exciting this year. Um, uh, the usual, you know, celebrities and world leaders and business leaders were there. Uh, in, in negative nine weather, uh, convening to talk about how we can improve the state of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's particularly exciting for me was we had a very technology-centered theme mm -hmm. around the fourth industrial revolution. That was the main theme. That was the main the theme. Year. And we mm -hmm. talked about its implications, uh, how it's going to change lives, and, and what it's all about. Could you uh, tell us a little bit um, Well, the fourth it, industrial right? revolution, in my opinion, is mm -hmm. more of a, a, a state of, of uh, of where we're, we're at, right? And I think where we're at is we've now got into this critical mass of technological development uh, in digital technologies, uh, in information technologies, the, the physical science of manufacturing and automation and robotics, uh, as well as uh, advancements in uh, you know, health and bio and sciences. That we are now really looking at a very rapid change towards a technologically driven industry where you know the way we envision telcos and banks and healthcare institutions will change and change in a very rapid pace. Mm -hmm. um, they also showed a combination of technology right like AI mm -hmm. where you can now use the, the ability to automate um, machinery information technology artificial intelligence to do things like self-driving cars. Okay. So you know a Tesla today can actually drive from a parking lot, turn itself on, and then come over to you, pick you up, yeah. or drive the car for you in the highway, switch the lanes, and maintain a safe distance. So the idea that was science fiction for me about a year ago, maybe, Just is year beginning ago. to yeah. come to life. Like the, the, the thought that there might actually be self-driving cars yeah. uh, in the next you know, few years, not, not even a decade, yeah. and that self-driving cars uh, has serious implications. A lot of good ones and some bad ones, but the really good ones are, I think if we have self-driving cars, we would have much more efficient use of fuel. So cut our, our fuel yeah, consumption definitely. by a significant amount, about 30% is what they said. We'll uh, cut the amount of materials we, we use to build cars. We don't need a driver's cab, so we just have that. And then the third was very interesting question. So what happens if you don't ever have to buy a car? What does that do to Toyota or no, exactly. you know, BMW? What does that do to the, the auto industry <coughs> and by extension, all of the support? Uh, and that's the exciting part of Davos, yeah. when we talked mm -hmm. about uh, the fourth industrial revolution, because it does kind of, it makes me think, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that we talked about that that's just self-driving cars, right? And then the other phenomena, things like Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? And then the technology that powers Bitcoin, distributed ledgers, distributed transactions. What does that do to transaction institutions like bank? Right? What if I don't ever need to go to a bank? What if I just give you, Chris, mm -hmm some pesos, and you will turn that into digital cash, to, by the way. <laughs> and then you can now start buying goods, right? We never ever have to use you know, a, mm -hmm. a media area in the middle. So these are the things that 
I think we'll, we'll introduce profound change and we'll introduce it at a rapid pace that we've never ever seen before. And it's good and it's bad. So a lot of people worry about jobs because automation does replace I mean, menial jobs yeah. or repetitive jobs. Those but if you jobs. look at it, and if you don't fear it and you attack it, I think it also opens up incredibly new, new uh, opportunities. Uh, I think in the Philippines, for instance, uh, when the fourth industrial revolution comes, and we're gonna be ready for it, it's gonna herald the era of the micro-entrepreneurs in the Philippines, right? An Uber driver is an example of a, of a micro-entrepreneur. When I feel like I wanna make money and I'll drive, I'll turn it on. <laughs> then I use my car yeah. and I'm in the transportation business. When I'm done, I turn it off and I can hang out or do things that you know, I like doing, surfing or you know, doing other things like art. So I, I think it's gonna not remove the ability of human beings to make economic gain. It's just gonna shift it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, pretty much like every other revolution has, it's yeah. shifted, like say the economic power of it. But there was a lot to unpack there. Let's 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 discuss maybe time frame first. Um, I know no one really has a definite time frame in it, but which of these out there technologies um, do you think will mm -hmm. will we be seeing as part of our daily lives? Uh, I think the soon. the digital uh, transformation part of uh, the Industrial Revolution will precede it, right? It's easier to implement, mm -hmm. right? Platforms, for instance, like Amazon, uh, enable people with great ideas to be in the information business. Um, social enterprise allows you to grow it like wildfire, mm -hmm. right? And advances in media delivery allows you to deploy anything, you know, you know, in, in a mass scale. And that's kind of the story of Rappler. You guys are disrupting the market mm -hmm. and we're able to leverage this infrastructure <laughs> that that came about. So I think digital technologies will come first, right? And this will be augmented by big data. It's going to be augmented by artificial intelligence, analytics, and transaction capability with blockchain. So I think it will precede everything else. Uh, oh, because sorry, sorry. Um, transactional, so could you repeat that? Trans transactional uh, capability with blockchain? Yes. So um, we know blockchain as Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? It's the ability oh, to change cryptocurrency yes. from one to the other. Mm -hmm. Blockchain allows people to actually transact without the need of massive servers and mainframes, right? Because mm -hmm. you can do peer-to-peer -peer peer -to -peer transaction peer, yeah. times a million, yeah. right? And I think that capability is about to become mainstream, mm. right? And so the need to buy very big servers, uh, the ability, the need to have institutions uh, that house massive amounts of data, that starts to become less important and the ability of people to transact electronically, uh, privately if they want, uh, is, is about to become real. And so you combine that with you know, disruptions on um, transportation and, and accommodations and payments. So Airbnb, Uber, Airbnb, Uber PayPal, <laughs> right? Yes, basically, and yeah. so think about that and then think about yourself as an integrator. If you're, sari, if you, if you're the digital Sari Sari store, it's just a question of mixing and matching all these technologies to mm -hmm. offer that value you want to bring to a customer. Okay. The thing is, um, so for example, uh, these technologies are, are almost, I would imagine, almost mainstream in places like Silicon Valley, um, in, in LA, in Davos, but how far are, are we, let's say in an emerging market, let's say in the Philippines, from, from, actual, from most, from the majority of users um, actually using it? Because even now, not everybody, I, most, most, most young people have a cell phone, but it's still, there seems to be a bit of a, of a catch-up phase. Yeah, I, I think it's closer than you think. There are a couple mm -hmm. gaps. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, first of all, smartphone penetration is not quite as prevalent yet as we want, but it's moving really fast, mm -hmm. right? You're seeing smartphones now become sold for as low as 888, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's a supercomputer in your hand. Basically, right? yeah, so that's th a computer that 10 years ago. Everybody should be able to, to use that as a leverage. Secondarily, we're more and more connected um, and then, then we have our indigenous innovation here in the Philippines. And one really good example that I've seen is how do you empower people that have no access to banking systems, right? And it was kind of sad to think that when Uber comes to the Philippines, Uber is a better service than the taxi and also cheaper than a taxi. And only the rich can afford it with credit card, mm 
Yeah. And I think what we've done here, the telcos, both telcos, are enabling people to take cash into airtime load and airtime load into Uber fares, right? So that's indigenous mm. innovation that will enable mm. companies like, or countries like the Philippines to take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution, to take advantage of the sharing economy like Airbnb and Uber. So we have our, our little piece to play yeah. and not necessarily having to copy everything from the United States or the developed countries. And we need it more and we'll probably innovate faster uh, because we have to consume our resources a lot more efficiently because we don't have as much. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's going to come about and I think you know, we'll, we'll do a good job uh, in doing that and it'll be exciting. Okay. Well, what are some of the other tech, uh, other new technologies, the new synergies I think that could, um, that you'd like to highlight from the fourth industrial revolution? I think 3D printing mm -hmm. is very interesting. I think that if you look at the, the chain of delivering a good uh, you know, physical good to you, right? Let's mm -hmm. say a mug, yeah. right? I would need to create the material, I'd send it to a factory in China, I'd manufacture the, the cup, and then I would box it and I would put it in, you know, I ship it to the Philippines, and it goes to a warehouse, then it goes to SM, then you go buy it, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's very, we're very close to an era where you just print it. <laughs> or you go to a printing shop that prints it. Right. So first it would be a pretty uh, neighborhood printing shop where yeah. you want something done and then... Imagine going to SM and you're not browsing anymore, person. right? You browse first yeah. and then you order your cup and then you go to SM and you go pick it up, right? Mm -hmm. That is profound and it's possible now. And I think in, in countries like ours, right, we're now becoming... We're, we're one of the fastest growing economies. We're beginning to consume, mm -hmm. uh, but we're still heavily importing, right? If we can reduce imports and produce our own goods like lo hyper-locally, then that's exciting. And I think that's not far away. I mean, next 10 years, we'll have that. So uh, what are some of the ways that we can prepare for this, I guess? Or what's, what's some of the best ways to um, exploit this, the synergy? Well, everyone should become a geek for one, right? We need to yeah. embrace technology. <laughs> it's going to be a part of our life. You've um, success, successful like Winston here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just geek. I'm happy yeah. that people are beginning to, uh, to recognize it. But I think there's... You know, we're inherently geeky, right? We, if we don't create, we consume uh, mm -hmm. technology and we consume it very well. So I think it's just more self-awareness that, hey, I can do this too, right? I can take uh, a content by just, you know, finding something interesting and publishing it somewhere else. Uh, I think that we should continuously uh, think of things that, Im that it would empower us as entrepreneurs, right? You can be an entrepreneur for an hour, for a day, for a year. Uh, but that also the idea of, hey, with all these capabilities and technology that's accessible to me, there's got to be something I can do with it. So just the keeping that curiosity about what, what the world can become mm -hmm. with more capabilities. And also to be impatient, right? To be able to say that, hey, if I, don't, if I can't find it there, I should just do it, yeah. <laughs> right? And I think Filipinos, uh, our millennials here in the Philippines, um, demonstrates or you know manifests that very well now, and it's exciting to see. Um, so that that's you know just fundamentally to understand that the cult the fourth industrial revolution is as much a technical revolution as it is a cultural revolution, mm -hmm. and I think okay. we need to yeah. you know mentally prepare for that. For the uh, for the non geeks, I guess I, I would imagine they would be overwhelmed, shall we say by all of these different <coughs> synergies and driverless cars coming at them and, and 3D printing. What, what's um, a good way to get up to speed, I guess, for a non-geek, for someone totally not... not I think if you look at the that. Philippines, you know, we all have a little geek in all of us now, and mm -hmm. there's a 100% penetration of Facebook, I hear, <laughs> uh, in the country, so you're yeah, already consuming <laughs> yeah. technology. Uh, but I think to be observant, right, mm -hmm. to, to realize that, you know, when you use Facebook, for instance, the idea that you're able to publish your video and then your friends are seeing it, that's kind of a way of understanding what it is. Mm. Uh, to see how things are being replaced. Uh, like we used to be, taxi used to be the only option for public, you know, privately driven vehicles. Mm. Now Uber is available. And I think geeks and non-geeks use Uber, yeah. right? Uh, pretty soon geeks and non-geeks will use Airbnb as well. Um, 3D printing, like when it light. becomes real, it's, it's y you don't kind of, think about the technological aspect of the resin and the printing and the 3D that's behind it, but you're just saying, I can get a cup <laughs> yeah. whatever I want, the way I want it. Um, so that's just gonna, it's, it's gonna be thrust on, upon, onto us mm -hmm. and uh, just keep an open mind, I guess is the best, the best advice to it. 
Let's, let's talk a little bit about the the negative side, the dark side, shall we say, the uh, Darth Vader of uh, of this fourth industrial revolution. Um, so you mentioned uh, it could sort of it it could skew labor as revolutions tend to do, as they always <coughs> do, right? Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of inequality in the world. In fact, the World Economic Forum itself came up with a report, I think it was commissioned by Oxfam, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. saying that 1% uh, owns 96% pr of the world, and technology actually sort of exacerbates or makes the problem worse. Yeah. And that is my biggest fear, because mm -hmm. the fourth industrial revolution will create an opportunity divide, right? So the rich and the capable, the developed countries tend to become more capable of adapting to AI and technology and all that stuff. Meanwhile, you know, a lot of the developing countries are still stuck with second and third revolution, right? They're still there. And so we talk a lot about that, right? And how do you enable and empower? LTE. Yeah, and, and how you do that. I think that it's just important uh, for uh, countries like the Philippines to be vigilant, to have, you know, the younger majority of our population to think more about how we can innovate and connect with the rest of the world. But that must also be aided by government policies to, mm. you know, enable us to catch up to the technological advances of the world. Basic things like everybody should have internet. Mm -hmm. Everybody should have access to, you know, technical education if you so choose to do that. Uh, Micro-entrepreneurs has, you know, you have to support them because they're the future platform of monetizing the revolution. Um, and then we can leverage our key strength over developed nation is that we have a young population um, that will be the future consumers. Mm -hmm. And if you look at emerging countries, we have growth, whereas developed countries have stopped growing. And then we get to define and, and really be conscious about defining our consumption based on what brings most value to us. So I think if we're up on our toes and we're ready for the revolution, I think the disadvantage of the skills gap and the capital gap will be less pronounced. Mm -hmm. uh, it will, it will bring that will be a factor, but we can make that less pronounced. Is the gap if, just if we're ready? Just too far, I guess. It's too far. To I mean, you know, uh, where can you go today to hire AI developers, mm -hmm. right? Where can you go today to hire material scientists in the Philippines? Mm -hmm. There's none, mm -hmm. right? But we're going to be the next consumer. We're the fastest growing consumer. Why don't we define that? <laughs> right. So it's, it's a little bit of a, so it's a lot of it's just awareness. A lot of it's conversations mm -hmm. uh, among us to say, like, let's, let's, you know, find our place in this new, new world mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and take it, win it. We're saying consumers, um, and we could be, we would have a lot of consumer power with this, right? Um, what I'm, what I'm personally interested in is, it seems that a lot of the things that the fourth, um, the fourth industrial revolution, I just call it the revolution from now on, that the revolution entails, seems to be very capital intensive. I mean, 3D printing, um, driverless cars. Well, you think of, when you think about owning it yourself, and you don't overly the mindset of a sharing economy, yeah, it's very expensive, mm. right? It's almost like thinking, if I want to be a rappler, I have to build a computer, a server, a data room, and stuff, right? Uh. But in our time, we have Amazon, <laughs> yeah, right? I see. We have PayPal. Mm. We don't have to build a bank. We have PayPal, or we have you know PayMaya, or we have other mm -hmm. financial technology we can leverage. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't consider it more as a capital gap. It's about really more of an intellectual capacity gap. Mm -hmm. And I think the best way to approach it is not to rely solely on institutions for education. Um, knowledge can now be obtained wherever you live, wherever you are. I mean, any of the MIT courses now are available at MITx, right? And you can mm -hmm. download it. MIT, Stanford. Um, yeah, so it's awareness. Uh, and, and that's why I'm excited about this because it's not as capital incentive as it is. It's intellectual intensive. Okay. And that we have plenty of. Our mm -hmm. Filipinos uh, have the ability to uh, get up in there and, and work with, uh, you know, if we have a community, if we collaborate, and we become active of this. So I'm trying to become a very strong advocate about the Industrial Revolution in that, hey, it's an opportunity for us, and we should be prepared for it. Hey, let's, uh, let's say hypothetically, or it could even happen in real life, who knows. Let's say um, you're made the commissioner of, the, let, let's say everybody, 
understands the importance of the fourth industrial revolution and you're tasked with coming up with specific policies to best prepare um, the country what are some specific policies that you would put in place well I think the first thing that we should uh, really support is micro entrepreneurship mm -hmm. uh, I'm an entrepreneur myself and I think More all the other companies right yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I think that if you have to drive the passion and the enablement to be an entrepreneur. You yourself, the entrepreneur yourself, will acquire the necessary skill, will acquire the necessary capital, will acquire the necessary infrastructure to be successful. So if we, we spark and ignite the entrepreneurship spirit in the country, uh, starting with you know incentives, starting with nurturing, starting with empowerment. Like what kind of incentives, for example? Well, help us in capital, like what Singapore is doing you know, mm -hmm. for research and development. Uh, make our workforce flexible for tech workers so that it doesn't all, you don't look at our labor as homogeneously manufacturing era. Mm -hmm. um, bring in more um, help in terms of importing knowledge that we don't have. Uh, strengthening our, our educational institutions uh, fine-tuning that to what the world's looking for versus what the tech should look like. Mm -hmm. um, and then allowing uh, small capitalization to uh, small entrepreneurs. We don't have that today. Nobody's funding the entrepreneurs in a small scale. Uh, so I think it starts with that. Mm -hmm. And then everything else will make it, will boost it. So a lower cost internet, uh, you know, fixed transfer transportation, uh, make us at par globally in intellectual property rights. All those things are support. But I think if we're successful in igniting the entrepreneurship fire in the country, would be would be on our way. And, and this is not a zero-sum game, This the, the revolution, right? It's not going to be putting one country against them. Against it's the not. Matter. It's not. And in fact, when you look at it, the ASEAN, you know, cooperating together has mm -hmm. a lot of opportunities to actually uh, do a good job here. Uh, we have a lot of similarity in the ASEAN region, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We're kind of mid-sized countries, right? But we have high growth rates, mm -hmm. and we're in a space where people think and Asia is China, <laughs> right? And it's good to start saying, no, ASEAN is very distinct and different, and that distinct and different uh, in a collaborative fashion can, can propel us into something more interesting. And as a market, we're 600 million people. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's a good opportunity for for us to be, we're in a good spot to to take our own niche and, and lead it. To find their own niche, niche, I guess. Yeah. What, um, could you expound a little bit about that? Like, what do you think the Philippines could could focus on, I guess? A lot of things. What would be um, a, a natural fit for us? Well, so I always get asked, right? Mm -hmm. So when, it, when I was in the Silicon Valley, as you, as you were, people would say, do you have developers in the Philippines? And I always say yes, right? But we're less known as just a country with developers like India uh, because of our diversity. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think that diversity is something we should take advantage of. I think the Philippines have enough developers combined with enough creative people, combined with enough um, uh, business administration people. Right? You know, if you look around Asia, CFOs and, and attorneys are actually are mostly Filipinos as well. So if you look at that from that perspective, we have kind of a good makeup of an entrepreneur we're also uniquely capable, I think, of being more creative, right? uh, designing products, entertainment. The culture sort of begets that. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I think, I, think that's, uh, I think the creative economy, and that's actually one thing that people are starting to talk about too, which is the blending of transactions and entertainment. Something uniquely Filipino in terms of, of being able to take advantage of it, and I think that's exciting for us. Uh, Los Angeles, as an example, is the creative capital of the world. And they have both so say, Snapchats no, okay. and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and other products there. So mm -hmm. I, think th I think we should develop that niche for us, uh, combining our creative talent with our technical talent and, and be unique that way. Mm -hmm. And, and w what are some ways that the, uh, fourth, the, the revolution can sort of um, create new facets or new ways, new avenues to, to show that? I think for us, it lowers the barrier to display our, our greatest uh, capability. So if we had our own Amazon here in the Philippines, and I know we have access to Amazon, but if it was local and, and fast, mm -hmm. um, if we have the ability to create a lot more rapplers in different facets, not just you know news and entertainment, but also in other areas, uh, if we um, you know highlight our capabilities 
in the way we develop software and what we've done there, and then reinvigorate uh, you know things that the Filipinos were popular with, like creative furniture from Cebu, and you know um, you know our our, um, our arts, our, our performing arts capability, and I think if we harness that into a unique niche. I think I think there's something there for the Philippines, and you know we can maybe trigger some kind of. Uh, our own revolution Some in terms spark. of yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> spark it and yeah. ignite it and kind of scale it up. Cool. Um, what are some of the, the geographical or like real world threats, I guess, to the uh, the revolution? I mean, world, the World Economic well, Forum is very global. It's it's in the name. The threat's pretty There's obvious, obvious right? So, Facebook and Google makes more advertising than our local companies in the Philippines, and that's an impending threat. But I think it will happen if we let them be. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Facebook and Viber and all the OTT players can replace our telcos if we don't do anything about it. And by the way, we are. Mm -hmm. But but the threat of industrial revolution is the fact that it's also globalization. Yeah. Right. So everybody can play in everybody's space, and the boundaries blur out. This right? kind of seems like globalization bordering on imperialism. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. So uh, we should be a bit constantly yeah. vigilant about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that it's it's going to cause severe destruction of economies and all of that. But I think that uh, it would be good to blend uh, what we consume digitally as an example beyond Facebook and Google and you know, YouTube, right? And create our yeah. own uh, local capabilities there and not lose our own identity because we got invaded in by other players. On the, sec on, on the other part of it, we should start exporting things that are uniquely Filipino as well mm -hmm. outside uh, and, and, and invite people to experience things like tourism here in the Philippines using uh, digital technologies to do that. And uh, so I think there's a give and take. I think it's just really being conscious and not to just be blindly consuming, but also providing input uh, externally to the, the next economies that gets built. Where do you draw the line between being very, very open and at the same time not, I mean, allowing, uh, allowing local um, players to sort of create a space? I think it's open by default, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I don't think we close I anything mean, else. It's not possibility. It has to be open. Yeah, I think sense, the yeah. I think the idea here is to par up, mm -hmm. right? You know, catch up with the rest of the world. Don't get left behind. And so it's more of a, you know, don't fall asleep kind of story rather yeah. than, you know, make sure nobody comes through the door when I'm sleeping. Um, I think it's good because if you look at the, the culture of the younger Filipinos, millennials like you are, uh, you guys are hyperactive, uh, observant, curious, hungry. I think there was an acronym they used in Davos called ROI, restless, overachieving, and insecure. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that means it's good. Uh, they think it allows us to... Uh, to keep up with world trends. I mean, if you're going to generalize, it's a pretty good way to generalize, <laughs> I guess, right? Yeah, you must be able to go You have ROI written all over you. Yeah, and of course, the acronym <laughs> also speaks for it. There's going to be return on that investment or yeah. that mentality or that culture. Nice. Very clever there. How about some of the, um, the current trends? It, do any of the current trends, like the current global trends in the world now, do they have... Could they have a possible effect on on um, on this revolution? For example, China's shift to a more to a new normal, I guess, to a more producer, I mean, consumer-oriented economy, um, low gas prices, anything like that. Well, it's, it's definitely going to shift, right? So, for instance, if if the vision of of on-demand in on-site manufacturing becomes real, it changes the export exactly. scene, yeah. right? And I think that's positive for us because we're an importing nation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it would uh, necessitate that we understand and get caught up on design. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that's positive for us as, a, as an example in trade. Um, I think in our financial institution, it's a different story, right? If, if you can now transact, now, the financial uh, industry I is heavily regulated mm -hmm. and it's, r it's regulated because it can be regulated, but what if it can't be regulated because it's inherently distributed? So that's going to introduce profound change. But for me, where we have a country with very, very little financial inclusion, I think that's a positive disruption yeah. uh, in and that space. And I think it's a huge it, catch up ladder. It's a catch up ladder yeah. for us. It's, it's a good thing that gets us to participate more. I worry about the intellectual gap 
I don't think our, instit our educational institutions are is as good, mm -hmm. and I don't think as good as, as the, 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 the I guess the the rise in the best of the best. Well, the best in the, the developed economy. countries and mm -hmm. the fast rising economies like China, right? Yeah. We're behind, and I think that it has to be addressed with a combination of let's just get better <laughs> in the, on 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 the government side, on the institutional side, but augment that with things like peer to peer lender, le uh, peer to peer uh, training. Right, so a, a few years ago, I was worried about that, and I started a, a nonprofit group called DevCon. DevCon. And their sole purpose is actually peer-to-peer -peer training. And we got so tired in uh, information technology that what they teach at school is obsolete by the time you learn it. Yeah, that's one of the problems, right? It just goes so fast. It goes so yeah. fast. So we thought, well, you can blame the schools, but really it's because it's so fast. How do you make a cur curriculum about it? And a few people started DevCon, and the idea was, Let's pick up the latest and greatest technologies to train our peers, mm -hmm. right? It's a volunteer peer-to-peer -peer training, and, and now they touch about 10,000 people per year. Oh, wow. So that's, you know, this, this will scale, oh, wow. right? And yeah. I think that's those areas that will hopefully narrow. It's completely free, just yeah. out, of, out of the goodwill of their hearts, just wanting to like, teach each other. Yes, it's, it's kind of an advocacy, and mm -hmm. it's your profession, so it's, kinda, it's, it's, it's good to tr teach people art when you're an artist exactly, yourself. Exactly, yeah. So I think that's kind of how people feel about DevCon, but I actually think it addresses what I think to be the biggest gap in the industrial revolution. It's not, it's not capital, it's not regulation, it's not automation, it's, a, it's, it's an intellectual gap. The intellectual gap. Yeah, and we should probably be, be really, really vigilant on Vigilant it. on that. Would you suggest any specific policies for, um, for governments or like maybe even educational institutions? To yeah. some, like what would really sort of, I don't know, uh, drive the point home? I think invest in uh, the future and you know signal uh, that we are ready for this. I think DOST needs to evolve. I think the DICT needs to evolve. I think Department of Education needs to evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, but also for us Filipinos not to count on that. <laughs> okay. Right? And, and to, to basically do just, just uh, do our part um, at the same time. So um, I, I'm sure, as you're aware, the World Economic Forum has um, developed a reputation lately of being extremely elitist. Since you were there, could you? I, I did don't. You, did you feel that? I don't <laughs> think that's the case. I do. I would agree that uh, very high-powered industry people are there. I think the side of the World Economic Forum that's not unveiled as 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 uh, fairly yet is the fact that it really opened itself up to a lot of uh, youth into their thinking mm -hmm. uh, with very little barrier as long as you're an outstanding individual with the young global shapers. And we have a healthy, healthy you know, participation on that as Filipinos and they get to go to Davos for free uh, or heavily subsidized. And uh, this year, a Cebuano named Francis Solano, an artist, actually went to Davos and was invited to go there. I think they've very quickly combine that with social entrepreneurs. We have really good social entrepreneurs here like Mamakino himself mm -hmm. and Mark Ruiz. Uh, and uh, I think Davos and the World Economic Forum uh, do care about the collective progress of the world, not just in economy, but also in, in the ecology and, you know, and Quality the account of the work we do with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So I think those dimensions were not discussed Right, everybody feels starstruck with, you know, the CEOs of the companies going DiCaprio, there and Bono, Bono. And DiCaprio and Bono, but they weren't there Who because you were they were it's picked actually as quite personable. Knowledge yeah, they were there yeah. because they were because they were uh, elite superstars, but they were there because they were people that matter and have a message that cares. Yeah, so they so came, they, they were there because they cared. They, they were there because they they have a stake in improving the state of the world. So I think I think that's that's the face of the World Economic Forum you don't see. Mm -hmm. That's why two years ago we brought it here to actually have a, co uh, a, a, a community uh, discussion between the WEF and the Filipino leaders. And I think we're gonna start do that again this year, uh, right after our elections. Um, and, and speaking of, ele of elections, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. <laughs> Which of the current um, candidates and vice presidential candidates do you think could best drive um, the, the revolution for it to, to best uh, make it to best bring it to the majority of the country well I, I think that oh well, first of all I'm more excited about the Philippine elections than the American elections for <laughs> obvious reasons um, 
I believe at least three of our candidates um, uh, are in, in position to be curious about uh, the fourth industrial revolution and has, has put some leanings into technology. Um, but I'm, I'm optimistic that just like in this administration, I think that most people now uh, factor the, the young, the youth, uh, into the organizations that they eventually put together once they get elected. Um, but if you look at the amount of technological sophistication that our candidates are putting into analyzing their social feedback and the, the you know the analytics around the surveys and um, participation in world, world stage, I think you know we're beginning to be more aware about our global connectivity. Okay. Could I press you for something? For, for name more specifics, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the, the good news is I don't vote here, so I don't I don't get to pick. Uh, but we'll definitely be there to influence them, uh, leaning towards the technical re uh, industrial revolution. Yes. Okay, great. And great. on that note, um, I'll let you off the hook then. Great, thank <laughs> you very much. We've been speaking to Winston Damarillo about the impending fourth industrial revolution. I'm Chris Schnabel, and thank you for watching.